going to give it a very interesting title. It's going to be titled, Give Up. All right? So turn to your neighbor and tell them, give up. Normally, the encouragement is, don't give up. Don't give up. Hold on. Don't let go. But today, I want to say the exact opposite, which is, give up. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, we're going to read verse 1 onwards, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 onwards. And the Bible says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us, I'm going to insert that phrase there, give up. Throw off is basically give up. Everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The writer says, let us give up, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So over the course of the next three weeks, we're going to look at nine things in specific that we need to give up in our lives. There are many of you who are seated here this morning, and the enemy has worked at a clever strategy with you in helping you to hold on to things that you should have let go of a long time ago. He's put you in a position and in a place where you feel trapped and you're not able to give it up. And because you're not able to give it up, you're still in bondage, you're still in pain, you're still in trouble. So this morning, the word of the Lord to you is, give up. Turn to your neighbor and say, give up. So we're going to do three this morning, three things that we need to give up. And I would say it this way, give up to go up. All right? Does that make sense? Give up to go up. So if you want to move forward, you got to give up certain things. That's what the writer is saying. You know, throw off things that are, uh, you know, hindering you, that are holding you so you can run the race, meaning move forward with, with perseverance and with endurance, the things that God has set for us as well. So here's number one. The first thing that we need to give up. Give up on unhealthy relationships. All right, I'm going to start with that. Give up on unhealthy relationships. Relationships and friendships have a huge bearing not only in our life, but also in the direction of our life and future as well. And it's important that we make sure that the people that are in our life help us to move forward and are contributing into our lives and not just sucking the energy out of our lives. See, when God wants to bless us, on many occasions, He sends people into our life. That's how God blesses us, by bringing the right people into our lives. So when the devil wants to destroy us, what do you think he does? He brings people as well. So the question is, who sent the person that's in your life right now? Don't look around right now. It's not, you know, don't look at them weird or strange. There are some of you who are seated here who are trapped. And you are unable to move forward in your life because you're yet to sever the ties to those relationships that are damaging you. How can you identify an unhealthy relationship? That's what I want to look at. How do you identify an unhealthy relationship in your life? Let me give you three indicators that prove that those relationships must be severed. But before I move on, I need to make a disclaimer or clarify this. What I'm about to share with you here this morning does not apply to your spouse or marriage. 
Don't misquote me by saying Pastor Terry preached on giving up on my marriage. Because if the indicators that I am going to be sharing with you are prevalent in your marriage, then you need to seek help. And seek help in your marriage so you can help address those things and become stronger and better as a couple. It's not a way to get out of it. All right. And we have great counselors that are available in our church that specialize or certified in, in dealing with crisis in marriages who can help you. So reach out for help if you're struggling with those kind of things in your marriage. But I'm talking about in relationships in general and specifically to those who are not yet married. This is a great time for you to look at these indicators as well. So the first indicator of an unhealthy relationship or friendship is constant strife and division. Constant strife and division. Amos chapter 3, verse 3, the Bible asks us this question. It says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? The Bible says, unless there is agreement, unless there is a oneness, how can two people walk together? Meaning, how can they progress in life unless they're agreed upon something? A healthy relationship is one in which there is oneness of goals, purpose, values, and beliefs. And if there's a, a difference in these areas, there's bound to become frictions. And a healthy relationship has harmony and peace. The Bible says in James chapter 3, verse 16, it says, where envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. So when there's self-seeking or when there's confusion, there's a lot more that comes into the relationship along with it as well. So strife and division drain our energy. If you're frequently being belittled, criticized, for no reason in a relationship with someone, then you should begin to take the steps to cut that relationship or that friendship. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 3, the Bible says, It is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife. It's an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but every fool will be quarreling. Proverbs 17, 14 says, The beginning of strife is like letting out water. You know, like when a dam is open, the water gushes out. That's what the Bible says is the beginning of strife. So quit before the quarrel breaks out. If you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, which is not advisable, I might say, where you have an on-again and off-again relationship because you're constantly fighting with them, the word of the Lord to you here this morning is walk away from that relationship before you walk into marriage. Because imagine a marriage where you are on again and off again. That will be really hard. And that doesn't work. Because if you're already experiencing the on again, off again in your you know, pre-marriage relationship, that is enough warning signs for you to run from that person because you don't want to enter into a lifelong relationship with someone who is so unpredictable and who is so known to getting into trouble and getting into quarrel that you don't want that for the rest of your life. Even a kind, loving, wonderful person, when you get to marry them, married people will fill in the blanks. If you have friends who every time you are around them, they constantly criticize you or criticize someone you know. They gossip about others and their shortcomings. They make you feel inferior so that they can be superior. They may not fight with you, but they pick fights with everyone. So every time you hang out with them, this person is picking fights with everyone around them. They are, in a sense, looking for trouble to make trouble. And just because they are popular, or others think that they are cool, don't hang out with them. Just because they seem to be very popular in college or in your office, but these, this person just runs into trouble everywhere, stay away from them because whether you like it or not, given time, it's going to rub off on you. You're going to become just like them. The Bible is very clear. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 onwards, it says, Blessed 
is a man who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. The Bible says, don't stand, don't sit, don't linger among a group of people who are looking for trouble, who are looking to mock, who are looking to create trouble, because that's not going to be a blessing in your life. But instead, look for those whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaves do not wither and whatever they do prospers, the Bible says. So the Bible says if you hang out with people who are looking for trouble, you're going to be in trouble. But if you hang out with people who love the Lord, who have a passion for the things of the Lord, they're going to be stable in their life and that stability that you are around will bring blessing into your life. Why? Because whatever they do prospers. And if you're around people who are doing things that prosper, eventually that rubs off on you and you begin to do the same kind of things. Paul writes in Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18, he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions. He says, watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. And then he says, keep away from them. Come on, can we say this together? Keep away from them. That's the biblical instruction. For such people are not serving our Lord Jesus Christ but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people, the Bible says. They prey on naivety. They prey on people who don't know what's good for them or bad for them. The Bible says stay away from them. So the first indicator of a relationship that you should be giving up on is in a relationship where there's constant strife and division in your life. Stay away from them. The second indicator of an unhealthy relationship is a person who is controlling and manipulative. A person who is controlling and manipulative. See, there are relationships that prey on your heart and rob you of the control over your own life. Don't give power to any person to manipulate you and to control you. Nobody deserves that power except God. Only God should control our lives, control our thoughts, control who we are, not someone else. No person can make you lose your joy, your mind, your temper, or any other aspect unless you give that person the power. Come on, someone. Now, some of you are like, oh, I can't, I can't even function in life. I can't even breathe. I can't do it because they did this to me. That means you are in a bad, unhealthy relationship because they should never have the power over your mental and your emotion for you to give up or to come to that place where you're about to quit because of what they did or said or did not say. That's an indicator of an unhealthy relationship. Most manipulative individuals have Four common characteristics. Let me highlight them for you so you can look out for these kind of people. These are manipulative people. Number one, they know how to detect your weakness. They pick up, they're very quick at assessing you. They know what your weakness is. And then once they find your weakness, they use your weakness against you. It becomes a weapon in their hand to use it against you. And then when they've done that, through their plans, they convince you to give up something of yourself in order to serve their own self-centered interest. You become a slave to that person because they're manipulating you all the time to do what they want to do, not what you want to do. And then finally, in either your work or in your social or family situation, once this person who manipulates you succeeds in taking advantage of you, he or she will repeat the violation until you put a stop to the exploitation. Meaning, it's a lifelong slavery. Meaning you're going to be bound to that manipulation for the rest of your life because they know which buttons to push, they know what to say to you, they know what to do to you to get you to do what they want to do. Manipulative people have mastered the art of deception. They appear sincere and respectful, but that's just a facade because when you get to know them, 
They ensnare you into a relationship where they control you, control how you behave, control what you do. They don't let you make your own decisions anymore. Manipulative people are not interested in you except to use you as a vehicle to gain control so that you would become an unwilling participant in their plans. They have several ways of doing this, and many of you have been in that place in your life. They will often take what you said and what you did and twist it around so that what you said and what you did barely becomes recognizable to you. They'll say it in a different word, and you're like, I didn't say that. I didn't do that. But they would twist it around so well that you are shocked that you would have said that or did that. They will attempt to confuse you, maybe even make you feel like you're going crazy. Ever been there? Where the words that are said back to you are like, mm, what's going on with me? And that you, you become someone that is going crazy. They distort the truth, and they will not stop at nothing, even if it means lying to get you to do what they want you to do. Manipulative people can play the victim, and this is very important, can play the victim making you seem like you're the one who caused the problem, whereas it was them who caused the problem themselves. But still, at the end of the day, it seemed like you're the one who caused the problem. That's how manipulation works. Manipulative people can be passive-aggressive, meaning one minute they're all affectionate and nice, and the next minute they're standoffish, they're cold, and they keep you guessing whether, who, what they're like or what they're going to say. Why? Because they like having that control over you. In some extreme cases, a manipulative person can even threaten to commit suicide if you don't stay with them and do what they're asking you to do. And in those cases, you need to run for the hills because you are in with a cuckoo person who is going to drag you down with them. You need to give up on those kind of relationships and walk away from it. Let me also address the other side of the coin, which is if you are that person who is manipulating someone, stop it. Don't do that. That's not Christ-like. God will get account of what you've done in ruining someone's life. And that's, I'm serious. If you are meddling with, messing with someone's life, and you know what you're doing to them is causing them harm, I tell you, stop it in the name of Jesus. Because you will give account to God for what you've done to over someone's life. But if you're on the receiving end, you need to give up that relationship and walk away from it before it's too late. The third indicator of an unhealthy relationship is a person who makes you compromise your values and your character. A person who makes you compromise your values and your character. See, deception is a very successful weapon that the enemy uses very successfully among Christians. You're never going to have someone who will walk up to you and say to you, in two years' time, I'm going to make you greedy, corrupt, lying, adulterer, and a cheater. Do you want to be my friend? It never starts that way. It all begins very innocently. It begins many times very spiritually as well. Because that's a great deception the enemy works with, having the form of godliness, but denying every power of God thereof. First, they will open up to you about their struggles in their marriage. They will paint a picture of their spouse to be someone who is mean, unreasonable, dangerous, and vindictive. They will first get you to feel sorry for them, and make you feel really sad for them. While you're feeling sad for that person, they begin to weave a web of deception around you. Before you know it, they're texting you, messaging you, calling you in the middle of the night and crying to you about their horrible marriage. You feel like you are the helper of the helpless. You feel like you need to get justice for them and rescue them from this horrible marriage that they're stuck in. They even get you to pray for them. Pray for their horrible marriage. And in a blink of an eye, a marriage is broken, 
you were ruined, and you never ever thought that the end would come this way. But because you did not give up on that toxic friendship, you find that your future is ruined, and you've become the cause of a broken marriage. I'm not making this up. I've, I've been in situations where I've seen this happen firsthand. Marriage is broken. Children separated from their father and mother because there was someone who did not give up on that toxic relationship when they should have. Maybe for some of you, the beginning of, of that relationship begins with a question that is innocent and says, what's wrong with us hanging out together? I'm your friend. You're my friend. What's wrong if we hang out together? And you think to yourself, there's nothing wrong. You're a girl. I'm a boy. We can hang out. There's no rule. There's no scripture in the Bible that says man and girl should never hang out together. And it starts that way. And four months down the road, heartbroken, several compromises later on your values, you find yourself totally ruined. And that, my friend, is how the devil operates in bringing deception and breaking lives and making them compromise their values. Delilah, in the Bible, is a perfect example for this kind of person who is controlling. Not only did she manipulate Samson to give up his secret, but then she enabled him to compromise his values and characters till he could not even recognize that the Spirit of the Lord had left him, the Bible says. She worked with his life so long, Samson, who was supposed to have the Spirit of the Lord upon him when he would rise up and, and slay the Philistines, one day gets up and thinking that the Lord is with him, begins the battle and finds out the Lord had left him. Because over the course of that relationship with Delilah, so many compromises had been made that he lost the privilege of having the Spirit of God reside in him. For some of us, compromising might be in the area of fudging the finances or cheating someone of what should be theirs. Once the enemy gets you to compromise on one value, there is no end to what he will try to do to get you to compromise everything. That's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, it says, bad company corrupts good morals. Meaning you just need to hang out with these bad people and soon your morals are going to be corrupted. Your values are going to be devalued. And before you know it, you're doing things that you said you would never do and saying things that you never dreamt you would say. Why? Because you chose to not give up on that relationship. If you have people in your life that are doing these things I'm talking about, you need to begin today to take the steps to give up on those relationships. Because they're going to hinder your race. They're going to be a stumbling block to your future that God has for you. Turn your neighbor and tell them, give up. Come on, say it with some gusto. Say, give up. Number two, here's the second thing we need to give up. Give up on holding on to unforgiveness and bitterness. Give up holding on to unforgiveness and bitterness. One of the most devastating human emotions is the feeling of bitterness and deep hurts. It creeps into our lives, and sometimes we do not even know it, but it takes over our thought life and our feelings, and before we know it, we're captured in the claws of bitterness. It all starts with a hurt feeling or a misunderstanding over what was said or something they did or did not do. Then we choose to take offense over it. This thing, which is taking offense or being offended, is a choice. Did you know that? Being offended or taking offense is a choice. Thank you for that loud, resounding encouragement. You don't have to be all serious with me here this morning. You can choose not to get offended. Did you know that? You can choose to shrug it off and say, it does not matter. I'm going to keep walking. Even if they forgot to give you the invitation for that wedding, you can choose 
to go to that wedding anyways. Say, I'm not offended. I have a thick skin and a soft heart. I'm going to show up because I love you, man. I'm going to be there for you. I don't care. I don't need an invitation. I'm more part of your family than you are. Christians are almost like we're looking to take offense with people. Just say the word, I'm going to be offended. If you do this, I'm going to be offended. If you don't say it, I'm going to be, oh, pastor, if you preach that way, I'm going to be offended. And with all of us, we live with this almost like waiting to be offended life. God says, get over yourself. You're not that important. I am. Oh, hallelujah. Offense is a choice. Here it is. The longer you hold on to it, the greater the damage it'll do to you. The grudge, the hurt, the offense, the longer you hold on to it, the greater the damage it will do to you. Over time, that hurt hardens and becomes hatred. That's what happens. You hold on to a hurt long enough, it turns into hatred. And then you find yourself sitting in your room in the dark, fantasizing about the moment you will take revenge on that person and how you would be and where you would be when you would say that to them. Come on, I'm talking to someone here this morning. You know, if you don't let go of your hurt, that's what's going to happen. You begin to turn it into hatred where you begin to despise that person so much that it consumes who you are. And all you can think about and dream about is how you're going to get even with that person at some point in time and you even pray about it. And the whole time that you're going through this process and this emotion, the person who caused that hurt or that grudge has no clue. They've moved on with life. They wake up every morning saying, this is the day the Lord has made. And I'll rejoice in it. And you wake up every morning and say, this is the day the devil has made. I'll be miserable in it. It's because you chose to hang on to the offense and it became bitterness. I tell you this morning, give up bitterness. Give up hurts. Give up offense. That is not how a child of God is supposed to walk. Holding a grudge against another person can be devastating to you. I'm serious. I'm not joking around. It causes actual body harm to you. If you hold on to a a, a grudge long enough and becomes bitterness inside of you, it's going to cause depression, ulcer, heart attack, stroke. All these things are supposed to be linked to those who are controlled by anger and bitterness. I'm not saying anything to anyone right now. I'm not exaggerating. When it comes to bitterness... And, and, and unforgiveness, meaning refuse to forgive someone, refusing to let it go, to give it up, it will steal your destiny. It will steal the God-given destiny of your life. I've personally witnessed people who did not deal with the hurt in their life, and slowly I watched them wither away and walk away from the plan and the purpose and the destiny that God had for them. It's such a tragedy. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. And the Bible says to complain and utter loud noises, which is complaining and, you know, and all evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. In other words, the Bible is saying, give up wrath. Give up this anger. Give up this bitterness. They need to be put away from you. You cannot... Have that on your life and still move on. See, this desire to hold on to bitterness and anger is a classic work of the enemy. And he has a plan. He has an agenda when he gets you to hold on to the bitterness. Do you know what? This is what he wants to do. Number one, he wants to make you put yourself over God when you hold on to bitterness. That's been his plan from the very beginning. From Genesis chapter 3, his goal has been to make ourselves be put in the place of God. That's why he said to Eve, when you eat this fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be God. In other words, holding a grudge is basically saying, I am better than you. 
I would never have done what you did if I were ever in your place. And we all know that's not true. Because given the circumstances and given situations, all of us are capable of doing some very mean and nasty things, including myself. Why? Because <laughs> we're carnal. Oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord. As long as we are here on earth, that carnality, that flesh, has to be crucified every day. And what the enemy does is by getting you to hold on to that grudge, he's making you say to that person, I'm better than you, I'm more superior than you, because I'm not going to let go of what you did, because you should not have done that over me. Putting ourselves in the place of God. Next, what he does, he wants to make us act as though we are a better judge than God is. That's what he wants to do. When you hold on to bitterness, you're saying, you know, actually, God doesn't really know how to bring justice. I know how to bring justice. Paul writes in Romans 12, 19, and he says, Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but give place to wrath. Not your wrath. He explains it. He says, because vengeance is mine, and I will repay, repay says the Lord. And if your enemy is hungry, then, oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord. There's that feeding again. Feeding is, is a great way of healing. Feed people who are upset and angry with you, and they'll be your friend for a lifetime. If we hold a grudge, we act as though God is not a just judge. That's what we're saying. We act as though we are the moral guardians of this galaxy, and we don't want to hold this wrong. If we don't hold this wrong against this person, it's going to slip away into oblivion, and no one's ever going to justify this unjust that has been done. Did you know that? God is a righteous judge, and none of the works of man is ever going to go without being judged. All of us will give account to God for what we have done and we said. Meaning, however horrible that person did to you, you still have to give it up. Because God is a true judge, not you and I. Turn your neighbor and say, give it up. Third reason why the enemy wants you to hold on to bitterness, he wants to take away the power of the cross, to make the cross look foolish and weak. Because Ephesians chapter 4, verse, verse 3, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators as the children of God, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. So in other words, Paul is saying, forgive as Christ forgave you. When we hold on to a grudge, we cancel out the cross and the incredible undeserved forgiveness that we experience through the cross. So when we hold on to grudges, we mock the power of the sacrifice of the cross. And what does the cross stand for? It stands for absolute, unconditional forgiveness that is offered to anyone regardless of how horrible and what, whatever mean things they did, they can qualify for forgiveness. And that's what the cross did. And those that have received the forgiveness from the cross... The Bible says we need to also offer the same kind of forgiveness to others. The fourth thing he does by getting you to hold on to it, he wants to help you destroy yourself. That's what he wants. His ultimate goal is to destroy you. God cannot and will not use someone who's holding on to offense and hurts. Come on, someone. To make it very clear to the disciples, Jesus even shares with them a parable about a servant who was forgiven a huge debt. And then he turned around and instead of forgiving someone who had a small debt against him, he pursues that person. And then Jesus ends that story by saying this in Matthew chapter 18, verse 32. And this is how Jesus ends it. And he says to them, Then the king called in the man that he had forgiven and said, You evil servants. 
I forgave you the tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid his entire debt. And that's what my heavenly father will do if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. You might be seated here this morning and listening to me and you're thinking to yourself, it's easy for you to say, you don't know what that person did to me. And you're right. I do not know what they did to you. But I do know one thing. You choose to carry on that bitterness and that grudge, it will destroy you and hurt you. You have to make that decision this morning. Either you're going to hold on to it and fester and allow it to destroy you, or give it up and allow healing to take place in your life. There are some of you who have allowed that bitterness to build a huge fortress in your life, and you've been controlled and dominated by those bitter things that you've allowed to grow in your heart. This morning, God is saying to you, give it up. And God is here and available to help us, especially for those who have trouble giving it up. God says, I'll help you. And I'll, I'll pour the, the balm of Gilead over you. And I'll bring healing. And I will restore you. I will strengthen you. And I will re recompense all that you have lost as a result of what you've been through. That's our faithful God. You have to give up bitterness and hurt if you want to go forward in your life. Number three. This is a good one. Give up letting others determine your worth and fear of people. Give up letting others determine your worth and the fear of people. Over the last 40 years, there's been several studies that have been conducted that have determined that the way we see ourselves has a great impact on the way we act and behave. Our self-worth, self-esteem, seems to be the governing factor in our life. Meaning, if we see ourselves as a loser, we end up, to a large degree, acting like a loser. If we see ourselves as a victim, we tend to le let people victimize us. If we see ourselves as a piece of junk or garbage, then we let people treat us as junk and garbage. Our beliefs about ourselves determine our behavior. So the important question is, who is influencing your beliefs and self-worth? Because there's such a pressure in our day and our generation to allow other people to determine our self-worth and value. We crave so much to know what they think about us. Especially in our Facebook generation, there's such a great desire to be wanted, to be liked, pun intended. And we're so obsessed with this. Do they like my picture that I posted five seconds ago? I've only got three likes. What's going on? Why didn't George see this yet? Maybe I should instant message him and ask him if he's seen my post. We're so obsessed with this. This need for other people's approval, and we allow the approval of other people to determine our value, and by doing so, we're letting them control our lives. And God is speaking to you this morning. He says, give up letting other people determine your worth and your value. They did not create you, I did. I breathed you into form. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. They didn't just know you since yesterday. I made you wonderfully complex in all your innermost being delicate. I know everything about you. I know what I've created you for. Get your sense of worth and value from me is what God says. Don't let people tell you who you are. I will tell you who you are because I created you. I made you in my image. I know for the very purpose I put you here on earth for. Come to me, and I will tell you about the incredible gifts, the talents, abilities that I put inside of you when I breathed into you life. I love this scripture. 
in the New Testament, Paul write, uh, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And he says, he says, you are chosen people. You're royalty. Did you know that? We're royalty. Did you know that? We are kings and queens. We are prince and princesses. Fifteen people thought that was cool. God's borrowed possession. God's very own possession. As a result. Hold on. So this is where he, he says. See, proceeding to this statement, he says, you're chosen, you're royal, you're a holy nation, and God's very own possession. And because of that, as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. Meaning, you should not let others determine your value. You should let God determine your value and then show it to others what God said you are and who you're called to be. For he called it, called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for his goodness and grace. We were lost. We were, we were deep in trouble, but he called us out of darkness into his gracious light. And because of that, we've been chosen. We've been given a destiny. And he says once, you had no identity as a people. Now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you've received God's mercy. Give up letting people Determine your self-worth. God is the one who determined your self-worth when he made you, when he created you, when, you, when he put you in your mother's womb. He determined it. And allow God to speak into your self-worth, not people. The other side of this coin is the fear of man. You know, we're so afraid of what people will think. We're so afraid of what, what they will say. And because of the fear of people and fear of man, we many times let go of convictions. We don't say what we should have said. We don't do what we should have done. When your boss is, you know, pressuring you to do what you know in your heart you should not do because of the fear of man, you give in and compromise. It's destroying so many children of God, the fear of man. And that's why the apostles stood up and said, we will not fear man. There's one thing we will fear, which is God. That's who we will fear, and that's who we're going to give account to, not to man. And that's something we struggle with in our society, which is this constant need to please people, to please man. You're not called to please man, you're called to please God. We're called to live our lives to be a pleasing aroma to God, not to man. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25 says, Fearing people is a dangerous trap. But trusting the Lord means safety. Oh, hallelujah. The writer says, fearing people is a trap. The enemy is setting up traps for you so that you will do things that you never would have done because you are afraid of what they will say or think. And even in friendships, it happens all the time. Oh, I'm afraid they will unfriend me if I don't go there. I'm afraid that they will not talk to me if I don't do this with them. So I'm going to do what I know I should not be doing because I'm afraid if I don't do it, they won't be my friend anymore. So many young people have walked into traps in their life because of the fear of man. Give up. Give up the fear of man. There was a father and a son who lived in a village. And they owned a big farm. They were pretty far from, from, from the city. And one day, you know, in the farm, they had a donkey that they wanted to sell. So the father and son decided on Sunday, they're going to take the donkey to the market in the city and sell the donkey. So they began the journey on Sunday morning as they began to walk towards the city. The father sat on the donkey and the little boy was walking beside the father. When they went through the first village, they heard people commenting, man, what a cruel man. He's sitting on the donkey, making the son walk. He should be the one leading the donkey and putting that fragile little boy on the donkey. So the father, as soon as they left the village, said, son, I'll get down. You sit on the donkey. Let's go. So they switch places and they continue walking. They go to the next village. Hear the people saying, what an idiot son. He should be letting his old, frail father ride the donkey, and he, the strong one, should be leading the donkey. As soon as they came out of the village, the son said, Dad, 
that switch. So they switched again. The father sat on the donkey and the son started leading the donkey. They went into the next village and all the people said, oh my word, look at that fat man sitting on that poor donkey. It's barely able to walk. Both these guys should be walking along with the donkey. So then the father got off and they came to the next village and the father was carrying the donkey. I tell you, if you try this game of trying to please people, there's no end in sight. You will never be able to please everyone. So let go of that thought right now. It'll free you. It'll free your, your life. Because if you're trying to please everyone and be a friend to everyone, that's not going to work in real life. You're going to have some people who will be offended. And they were offended because they chose to be offended. It's their, it's their problem with God, not yours. If 50 people are offended with you, praise the Lord. Lord, I am not offended with them. They are offended with me, so deal with them. I'll keep walking in love, and God will take care of you. Some of us, we live in such fear of people that we allow them to dictate our life, our decisions, how we live, the way we live. And God says, that's not how I intended for you to live. I have set you free from the bondage of sin, from the power of man. You don't have to live in fear of man. You live in fear of me and my word. And when you do that, I will bless you. I'll prosper you. I'll make your name great. We need to give up that fear. We need to give up allowing people to dictate our self-worth. So three things. I want to remind you this morning, as you walk out these doors, three things that you need to be starting to give up in your life. Number one, give up those unhealthy relationships. You know what they are. As I was speaking this morning, the Spirit of God was bringing them into your mind. I don't have to do that. He can. And if he's done that convicting, then it's your responsibility right now to say, God, give me the strength to let go of that. I don't want to walk in bondage again. I don't want to walk in being crippled by this relationship, I want freedom from this. Number two, give up on that bitterness and that unforgiveness. You got to forgive that person. You got to let go of that hurt before it destroys you, destroys your children, destroys your family, because that's the plan of the enemy. He wants to use that grudge and turn it into such a poisonous weapon in your life that it will destroy everything that God intended to do. Give it up. And number three, give up. Letting others determine your worth and the fear of man. Because when you do these things, the writer in Hebrews says this first scripture we read, and we'll read it again as I finish here this morning. Hebrews chapter 11, uh, 12, verse 1. He says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us give up everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Amen.